Okay, welcome everyone to today's lecture. So Matei is currently traveling, so I was presenting you today's topic, uh, which is not listed here, but it is fairness in causality and maybe also AI and how we can help with the use of causality to make our models and predictions fairer. So first we might want to ask, why do we even care? There are a lot of biases in the real world. And basically if we train our models on these data sets that are collected from real world data, they will adapt these biases. To be fair, we would like to prevent this from happening. And so you could ask ChatGPT, for example, to fill in some sentences and, and see the result. So the doctor told me that maybe he or she would be on vacation next week, or the secretary told me that he or she would be on vacation next week. Basically, I think you can guess it. If you ask ChatGPT, you get a really strong bias towards the doctor being male and the secretary being a woman. So in some cases, you get other pronouns and sometimes it's switched. But like on the first few examples I tried out, um, I, I got these results. And clearly, while it, yeah, I mean, you, you could say basically this is unfair, right? Because why do we have a preference for doctors to be male and secretaries to be female? So, I hate Zoom, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, we want to prevent our models to replicate biases that we have in the real world, because you can imagine if you just scrape stuff from the internet, you get like exactly these sentences more often than not. So for example, in historical contexts, even if you train on Wikipedia, because it has a lot of historical figures in it, the model is more likely to complete a sentence in that way than in another. Also, we just don't want to emphasize or reinforce biases. Machine learning models are also often used in medicine, jurisdiction, employment, or finance, even in the US, I think, for college admissions. So we want to prevent our models to discriminate against certain groups. And mainly, I think we will do this for ethical reasons. In finance, for example, or also in the medical domain, we are also required to report some of these statistics that I will show you in this um, lecture by law. So there's an inherent conflict of interest because basically we could boost our bank profits by denying loans to poor people, maybe because they are less likely to pay them back. And you can think of many other examples where this holds. So, it's not that we can achieve both, but we have to make a decision to, yeah, to be fair, to bring that to our models, because just by optimizing accuracy, we won't get fair models. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So as I said in the beginning, how do we do this? How make do we make our models fairer? Maybe another example that shows these biases also for generative models. If we ask stable diffusion to produce a photo of a firefighter, we get these white male appearing persons. And clearly, maybe it represents the distribution we had in our training data, but maybe it's underrepresents some minorities. It would be better if we could tell our model to also include yeah, a diverse um, set of people in this generation. 
So the question is, how can causality help us with that? To, yeah, employ causality for machine learning, we want to use the fact that, that causal models are white box. So we can inspect and reason about their biases, and we can encode explicit um, background knowledge into them. This is kind of difficult if we look at yeah, neural networks or other black box models. So we want to use them to, on one side, make predictions using causal models, and on the other side, to constrain and train um, yeah, neural networks with these models. So one of the benefits of causality is that we have a notion of how effects propagate. So if some attributes are correlated, like we saw in the previous lectures, we can maybe figure out in which direction the effects travel and how we can adjust for them. So there are a lot of biases and I'll list just a few of them. So I think in machine learning, the most seen or observed bias is observation bias. So basically we have a data set or some observations that are skewed in some sort of sense. Maybe we observe only positive examples or in medicine, only a certain type of patients reports back to us. Also choosing the right model, of course, is important. If we choose a too complex model, it might overfit and we won't be able to generalize and do unfair predictions for outliers. Then this is maybe more applied to humans. We have cognitive biases like stereotyping and hindsight bias. This is somehow important since these biases will be included in our data sets when we train on them. So we want to prevent our models from following our mistakes and biases. There are a lot of others, just listed a few, but I think you, you know where this is going. So basically, and I think even in normal statistics, we have all these notions of collider bias, right? Where we observe A and B and say C is hidden or latent. And we want to know is A affecting B or B affecting A? And maybe we now change the scenario. We say, okay, we, we don't know. And maybe we get new information. We want to collect new information. And now we condition on a collider. And by that, by the conditions you've seen in previous lectures, we connect these two. And it seems like A and B are correlated, which in this case, they aren't, right? So, I mean, the simplest example is probably that we have a Bernoulli distribution and we, we take the minimum of A and B. So assume they are Boolean variables. And we now only collect data where C equals to zero. And by this, we have a really high chance that via our formula, A and B were also zero. So it seems they are correlated. And yeah, usually this is known as the Bergson's paradox. The same applies if we fail to control four confounders. So it's the opposite case from before. Here we want, don't want to um, condition on the collider. And here we want to condition on the confounder. Basically, we have to be careful. And Matei said we should include memes. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, the question is how do we get these biases out of our models? And as you saw before, we already used the notion of SEM to help us understand the dynamics of our systems. Basically, do calculus allows us to identify the strengths of certain effects and to adjust them or at least be uh, adjust for them or at least be aware of them. So for example, we 
want to give loans to some kind of people. And we maybe want to make sure that we give equally many loans to, to women and to men. So to achieve this, we uh, define our predictions y hat, which yeah, estimates some target value y out of our observed attributes. And we want to want it to be invariant of certain factors, and we call these protected attributes. And this might include all the common things like cultural, back, uh, ethnic background, gender, maybe also body height or whatever you can think of, like eye color or some certain attributes that people can't control for, which they have no influence over, right? So the most simple idea is to say, okay, we want to have probabilities, like I showed you before, that are equal, independent of our protected attributes. So whenever we make a prediction, it should be equally likely that we get this prediction for some individual. Also, if we have some or had exchanged it for some other attributes. And now I framed it kind of already counterfactually, but you have to be careful because what this is saying or this is showing is a statistic over the whole distribution, right? We, we don't talk, at least for now, over individuals, but we say, okay, we want to give 50% of the loans to men, 50% of the loans to women. And this, um, yeah, by, by comparing these probabilities, we get some sort of disparity metric. So the difference, basically how unfair is our prediction? And zero or full equality means we are somehow fair and high values yeah, give us an indication that we are unfair. The problem is that we can still discriminate against certain groups. For example, if we now say, okay, we just give 50% of the loans to the most qualified woman, and then we randomly select 50% of the men and give them some loan. So further down, maybe, yeah, if we then measure in 10 years how successful they are, these groups will be kind of unequally distributed, right? Some, the one group will be more successful while the others will basically fail in many cases for whatever scenario we think of. So maybe we want to say, OK, we can't just look at our protected attributes, but we also want to make sure that we have our probabilities conditioned on the real labels, right? which we didn't include before. So what this does basically is that we enforce true positive and false positive rates to be equal for both distributions. And yeah, this is known as equalized odds. I mean, there are a lot of other definitions and things you can measure, but I think this is fairly common. And you could say, for example, okay, we just don't want to be independent of A, but we also only want to admit, admit students that are qualified, or maybe we want to randomly select um, students independent of of their qualification. So still, this might have some problem because it kind of reinforces some, yeah, maybe not historical biases, but biases in the label. Assume that we have two universities and University A has a course that qualifies 90% of their students for some loan or whatever for application to, to further studies. And University B has, yeah, does not offer this, this course. So only 10% qualify. By our metric, it is quite clear we, we will admit, 
admit 90% of the students from University A and reject 90% of the students of University B. And it kind of depends on what you are trying to achieve. But in the end, students of University B, therefore, will be underrepresented. And maybe we have a scenario where we don't want that to happen. So one third or other example would be equality of opportunity. And here we focus on the subgroups. So before we allowed or said, OK, it, we, we want these probability to be equal for any y. And here we now condition on the positive group, like, for example, students that are um, yeah, that, that can attend the course or are qualified. So the problem here with the like equal to the definition before is that we have the same problem with ground truth data. So we always, as long as we condition on a target variable and this target variable is unequal or unfairly distributed, we skew our distribution. So the problem is basically that all these notions are more or less correlational, right? We, we don't have any counterfactuals in there. We don't have any due operators in there. And as long as we do this, we balance probabilities between subgroups, which means that like for individual persons or some entities, we can always, or often find some metric or some yeah, distribution that discriminates against them. And what I was referring to in the beginning, it would be nice if we had individual fairness. And this means, so for example, consider Tom receives his rejection letter from university and he asks himself, would have been accepted had I been female. So this is an inherently counterfactual question because of course we, we can't observe the, the other outcome. And I mean, it's, it's already difficult to obtain all these data we, we need for estimating effects, but this is like one step beyond like we saw in the last lecture. So, we go with this definition of counterfactual fairness where we say, okay, for any individual, we want our probabilities to be equal, independent of some protected attributes, given that we fix all the other values which we use for our prediction. And now we, we get this um, formula or equation well, we basically do exactly this, right? We want to have some predictor, um, predictor y hat, and we give some exogenous variables. We assume them to be randomly sampled, or yeah, some some normal distribution, for example. And we have our observations x without the protected attributes. So yeah, they are the same. So doesn't matter basically, but if we have this instance, we want to yeah, ensure that the probability for having the observed attributes and the probability for setting the attributes to something else, to counterfactual values, uh, that they are the same. And the nice thing is, like I mentioned before, this definition no longer depends on Y itself. So we are independent of any biases we had before in, in our data set. Um, so I'll continue with some examples. Are there any questions, comments? Okay. So Consider, for example, that we have some 
yeah, insurance company that tries to yeah, compute some accident rate for its drivers. And maybe it wants to determine the, the cost it has to, to set for, for some applications for their insurance uh, policies. So basically, we have the scenario that we have persons with some cultural background and a certain subgroup maybe prefers red cars. Also, we have the driving style of a person that influences the accident rate, of course. But maybe we also say that the driving style leads to people or some driving styles lead to the fact that uh, people own a red car. I mean, of course, there can be latent factors and other factors, but I think for this simplified example, we, we can make the point. The problem now is that if we just take all our observed variables, or at least if we regress on X, like if some person owns a red car or not to determine the price for our policy, for example, we will discriminate against this one subgroup that prefers red cars because current, uh, yeah, because it um, coincides with this effect of driving style influences the, influencing the car color. And now what we would like to see or get is a condition on which of these attributes to regress, like which of these attributes can we use to estimate the accident rate of some individual. And what counterfactual fairness gives us basically is that it says our predictor will be fair if it is a function of all the non-descendants of A. And of course, not A itself. And usually what this means is here we can't use the car color because it is a child of the cultural background. And also we, we couldn't use any other downstream variables that might appear. Yeah, so the, the proof I just wrote it here is quite simple. Basically what it says is that um, if we only take features that aren't descendants of A, we get a distribution that is invariant to A and therefore we obtain counterfactual fairness. In some cases, we might be able to use some attributes of A um, to, to predict or make our prediction. But the problem is that usually um, we have some effect that biases our results. In some rare cases, these effects will cancel out. And we can see that in our causal models. So if we now do an average treatment effect analysis or some other effect analysis, we have to make sure that when we use A in our prediction, it has no influence, like no effect on, on our prediction. Basically, this is equal, I think, at least to just leaving A away from our data. But maybe we, we have images or something like this where we can't remove some factors or some objects, and we have to include it in our data. So the problem with counterfactual fairness is that it's quite strict in its assumptions. Oftentimes, we have a scenario like here where we want to predict the first year average of, of some student, where none of our uh, variables qualify for, for um, making predictions. So let's say the, the cultural background and the gender are protected attributes. We, we can't use it. And then we have the grade point average and the set, like the ex uh, entrance exam score for the students. But of course, maybe due to 
like their their background, where they are from, and so on. They these these factors influence their performance on these tests. So we we can't use them according to counterfactual fairness. And basically, what we are left with is doing a coin flip or taking the average um, for our prediction, which is not really that good. So in this paper, um, also all these examples are taken from this paper. It's really nicely written, I think, if you want to have a look at it. The authors propose to model additional latent features that we don't observe. Basically, we say, oh, maybe there is some knowledge that the student has acquired, or maybe there is some other metric that we can use to, to predict. Maybe it's the time a student takes to study that then gives us um, this first year average score, or at least an estimate of it. And the thing is, since we don't observe it, we, we need to infer it. But luckily, in our case, we can do this, right? We, we make a prediction of all of these variables, and we basically do a regression to obtain the posterior of, of this knowledge variable. And what we then can do basically is we say, OK, everything that can't be explained by or via the culture or gender of a student will be attributed to this knowledge that a student has obtained. So in the end, we can have a bit more of a fine-grained view on this. We can model individual yeah, error terms for all these variables. And I think this is quite closely connected on how we have obtained or defined our causal variables so far. Yeah. That's quite interesting because we need to observe gender and culture in this case to be able to. Yeah. Observe. Yeah, it's, it's, so I'm, I have to say, I'm also a bit skeptical about this, but basically what it says is that if you, make these predictions and i mean this is really the the worst case right where you can't use any of these uh variables to to predict anything so what you want to get basically here is a posterior distribution right you maybe you don't care so much about like individual examples or students but you rather want to say or see if whether this is maybe normal distributed and so on. So you want to get the posterior. And also here, right, you, once you have these models, you might be able to correlate them to some other attributes that you have. And maybe you then see, okay, some attribute has a greater impact on our GPA and maybe this error term tells us that it's really relevant for our first year average estimation. And maybe this LSAT thing isn't. So it, it gives us some way of yeah, estimating the, the effects of these variables on our prediction, even if we can't use them to, to estimate our average. So basically, in the paper, you see the following example. And uh, be aware, I showed you three levels. Um, and the authors only showed one of them. So I guess in their example, they, they all collapse, like beyond the first level. Um, you, you don't get any better. But what this means is now if we take this example, right, and, and we use all the attributes that we have, all the variables for making our prediction, oops, we, we get a really skewed um, yeah, prediction metric, right, where you say, oh, we discriminate maybe against skin color. We discriminate against their, their background, their, 
yeah, whatever. All the protected attributes, basically, we, we have a difference. Okay, here it's basically the same, but I mean, that doesn't make it any better. And we can set up our example, of course, in a way that, that this will also be different. So once we, we do these steps that we have seen here, like we, we exclude these variables, we now can do a regression that equalizes more or less our distributions, right? So what we say is these blue ones, I think it's quite hard to read, but these blue ones are the original data and the red ones are basically the, the same exact data points where we changed them, for example, the skin color or the, the country of origin. So yeah, this looks quite okay, I'd say. There are still a few errors and maybe we can adjust for this by including more data or getting a better regression. Like, I, I think it, it's quite, quite good. So as I said, or we, we have seen here, um, we will leave out some of these variables in order to, to do our regression and prediction. And sometimes this is referred to as fairness through unawareness. And I just want to put this note here that this doesn't mean that we do not care, right? We, we have to be aware of these attributes and we have to be aware of the causal structure. And even if we say, okay, now we, we have our causal model and we can do all these fancy prediction stuff, I think we have more or less shifted our problem to finding the right causal model, right? I mean, here it's maybe given and sometimes we have expert knowledge, but I think in a lot of cases where we only have observational data, we aren't even sure if the causal graph we obtain by a PC algorithm or FCI or whatever, if it's even the correct causal graph. Um, so if, if you play around a bit with real world data and run like add some noise and run PC multiple times, you will see that you get vastly different causal models out of it. And also the predictions you will then infer from them are really, yeah, yeah really different in, in most cases. So be aware that we didn't solve everything with just using counterfactual fairness, apart from like the problems that we sometimes have no attributes to, to make our predictions, but basically that we kind of shift our models because now we have to acquire also the, the causal structure for our problem. Yeah. So but basically not carrying also runs the risk of inducing these biases. Also, one thing that we need to be aware of is that oftentimes it's not enough to just say, oh, we, we protect the background of our student because maybe we, we can obtain data or attributes where we can infer the background of our students or that influence these backgrounds. So maybe we can get data on the country of origins of their parents or maybe other attributes that influence this. And basically what we want to require is some sort of closure where we say, okay, we also want to exclude any variable that really has an influence on our predicted attributes or that is suited to, to make predict uh, predictions on our uh, protected attributes. Also be aware, I think probably you've seen it multiple times that even like seemingly irrelevant attributes like the zip code, like the neighborhood where a person is living might be suited to give us some indication on the background, right? So maybe certain communities um, moved to certain locations or have a higher representation there. And so, yeah. And for that reason, including the zip codes might actually discriminate against certain groups of people. 
because we, we can infer the student block from, from them. So the third thing is, like I said, this counterfactual fairness is really like restrictive and really formal. And sometimes these definitions are also mutually exclusive. I, I think I showed you the, the most common ones and uh, there are a lot more. And usually they are defined in a way that you have to pick one because you, you can't fulfill them all. So maybe we, we don't care that much about our definitions and take a rather yeah, computer science or machine learning point of view and say, okay, we, we don't care how, how our results come to be. We just care about certain metrics. For example, maybe we want to optimize the degree attainment, like how many people go through all the courses and complete them successfully. And also we want to care about the diversity of, of our students. And the question now is, is counterfactual fairness fair? And I think I've given a hint on that. The problem most of the time is that when we need to exclude all of these variables, basically we are left with a random coin flip. We, we can't do any better. And this means for our metrics, so here the, the authors had um, listed the, the bachelor's degree attainment and the admitted applicants from a target group. And what we see is that the counterfactual fairness ranks way down here. And this yeah, purple line indicates the, the optimal decision boundary um, where we maximize graduation, for example, here at the top, or we have some trade-off between maximum graduation and some level of diversity in our admission process. So the, the thing here is, and I think this is more closely related now to these metrics I showed you in the beginning, that individualization forces us to throw away certain information. So we are too restrictive, basically. And I, I won't go into detail here, but there are then half-specific counterfair, counterfactual fairness metrics that try to prevent the situation and basically allow us to include these, these uh, protected attributes under certain conditions. Right. So in the end, for our models, it's always a, a, a trade-off, I'd say. And I think whenever we employ, employ these, we, we have to really think about and make sure to use the right fairness metric and adjust it to the scenario. We, we are in. Yes. How is the next graduation from the last month of the diversity implemented? So, how is the internet next? Um, oh, I, I think, like, if you would train, I, I think they had a regression problem basically. So, they assumed a linear model and basically they, they minimized, like, they defined some loss for, yeah, number of students graduating and diversity. I, I'm not sure which metric they use, but basically they defined some, some factor lambda and just added them together. Yeah, really, really something, I think. Um, okay, today's lecture will be a bit shorter, but it's Friday anyway, so that's nice. Um, yeah, as I said before, we have to be fair for ethical reasons and as required by law. We want to make sure that we trade off some of the performance for fairness in order to allow you know, ethical and, and yeah, lawful um, decisions. The problem with all these correlational metrics in essence is that we always equalize over subgroup probabilities. We discriminate or might discriminate towards individuals and we want to prevent this. 
And in the end, counterfactual fairness gives us a solution to this by going to the individual level. It helps us to measure the effect of certain attributes on the prediction. So let's say even if we decide to include some of the protected attributes for some reason, we can use our models to, to estimate the effects that, that this has on, on our predictions. And in the end, what you have seen is that we have this really nice criterion on the causal graph that tells us which attributes we can include and which to better leave away. So that's the lecture for today. Uh, thank you all. And if you have any questions, then please. No. Yeah. Is there a general debate about this? Because yes. <laughs> if, I, if I was a match, like my insurance company asked me, what is your race? Where does your mother can come from? Mm -hmm. it's race and so on. Yeah. It's quite, quite difficult to say, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, all my information and all private information. Yeah. I, please I, I... ensure that. It's yeah, I think you, you would be probably hesitant to provide all of this to them in the first place, I, I guess. But I mean, if you have like these big companies, also yeah, insurance companies, but also Google and whatever that really track and connect all your data, maybe they, they can infer this information from external sources, right? They, they can buy data sets. And I think this is why... Yeah, we, we need some sort of legislation to to prevent these kind of cases. And in order, like I showed you in the beginning, it, it would be the best basically for these companies to maximize their profits by yeah, discriminating against certain groups, right? So I think we need some sort of regularization. And I mean, this whole topic of fairness, I'm, I'm really no expert in this but it's i think one of the bigger and upcoming topics in computer science also but i think in in general there's a lot of of work on this yeah uh, yes so how, how they generated these? Yeah, I think here they, they didn't. So basically our lab has, so yeah, right, these, these people are from our lab. Um, they have developed a mechanism to like adjust certain parameters in the latent space of these diffusion models. And basically, I think what they did is they somehow emulated some randomization. So basically, they said, OK, I, I have a certain number of like values that I can set the skin color to, for example. And via this editing process, I inject this information into my, my latent space, and then the model will random basically randomly sample from from the skin color or country of origin whatever yeah yes so basically this means that um our distribution of firefighters the, the real one is like equally in the skin color and everything to the population yes and what are we doing if that's not the case yeah i, I mean that's <laughs> Maybe not a, a cheap excuse, but I, I think that's basically your problem as a computer scientist or the, the person setting up uh, these these models. I think you you have to make some assumptions on which distributions you you want to model, right? If you say, okay, it's I, I'm yeah, it's it's really important that I represent the distribution that I took my, my data from and replicated, then you don't want to do this, of course, right? But I think the, the problem is all these historical biases and cognitive biases, right? These, these implicit things that usually we, we don't think about. And if you look on the internet, on like any web forum or whatever, all these, these um, things you see there, there are all these texts, all these images, they are 
really biased just i mean really be because of only a certain subgroup of people posts uh yeah post content there and maybe only a certain subgroup has access to to these platforms right so i i think we we should tackle it more in this in this regard but the the most important thing is basically that you think about it and try to yeah encounter these biases whenever you you observe them but yeah it's it's really problem dependent okay any other questions comments okay then i think that's it for today thank you and see you next week <laughs>